We've been in a series titled Layers Deep and just dealing with some things that are beneath the surface and um, I'm excited to get into today's teaching, amen? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 32, starting at verse 22. He's talking about Jacob. And he arose that night and took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the fort of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, verse 25, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint and he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Verse 27, so he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. 31, just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Father, we ask that you may bless the word and bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. As you take your seats, look at somebody and say, fight for your freedom. Find somebody and say, fight for your freedom. Help me, Holy Spirit, deliver this message. As we're in a series of deliverance, I want to start off by laying a foundation and first and foremost saying that people are like icebergs. People are like icebergs, yeah. We are like icebergs. And what I mean by that is there is more happening in what we can't see than what is happening in what we can see. Amen, somebody. If we'll be honest, there are some things that are buried extremely deep in our lives. We've tucked them away. We've put them in places that only we know where they are. Only we know those emotions, those feelings, those experiences, those events that has happened in our lives. Those things are buried beneath the surface. And so we are stuck or we get stuck in life at times due to those things that are buried beneath the surface. There are certain things and certain fears and certain phobias that are empowered by the things we are hesitant to deal with in our lives. And so what lies beneath the iceberg, people can't see. What is above ground is what we let people see. And as a result, what happens is even our emotional reactions could be traced back to things that are beneath the surface. So there are things that are, that are layers and layers and layers deep. We bury them deep. We go through life. We just go through certain events, certain experiences. Things happen to us and we suppress it. And at different times in our lives, it may come up in a reaction at a, moment's note, at a moment's notice, and we don't even know where those things come from. And so we want to talk about deliverance this morning. See, God's plans for our lives is that freedom goes beyond. When God sent Jesus to save us, he didn't just have freedom from just sin or the devil in mind. When God sent Jesus, he also wanted to free us from those internal issues that may derail us in purpose, that may derail us in destiny. You are your biggest adversary. You are your biggest enemy. It's not the man, whoever the man is. It's not the neighbor. It's not that person. It's not the one that took your promotion. It's not the one that cheated you out of the deal. You are your biggest enemy. And so if you don't know what lies deep within your own life, 
Within your own soul, you are in danger of having yourself be self-destructed by the enemy. See, God is very intentional when he created us. And God is very intentional about life. For example, you are not just living to occupy time and space. You're not just here to breathe, get a job, pay bills, and die. So you, you're telling me this entire experience of life is get up, deal with the traffic of the day, deal with some coworkers that are not easy to love or get along with, pay a mortgage that I may or may not be able to pay off in my lifetime, and then just die. There has to be more to life. Anybody like me that's asking these questions? Like this, this you driving on the way to work, like this, 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 this can't be it. This cannot be what life was all. God, when you in your wisdom, in your power, in eternity was creating me, this is what you had in mind? I'm here to tell you, no. God has something greater in mind. God has something awesome in mind for you when he created you. God, all-powerful, all-knowing, does not make things that are mediocre. God makes things that are extraordinary. God makes things that make people go, wow. And that's you. Like somewhere in you, God decided to create only one version of you. Why? Because he has something in mind. There is a purpose that he has in mind. You exist on purpose for a purpose. See, there is a destination that God wants you to reach, that we want you to reach, that we need for you to reach. There is a destination. Now, success, therefore, is not based on what you possess. Success is rather based on functioning according to purpose. So it is possible to possess things and not be successful. It is possible to be balling in life but be spiritually bankrupt. It is possible to be winning in life. Like, yeah, I'm winning. Selfie, I'm winning. But spiritually, you're wandering. Why? Because success is not measured by what you have or what you obtain. It has to be measured according to purpose. See, success is this. Anybody that want the definition of success, let me give it to you right now. Success is measuring what you are doing against what you can do. I'll say it one more time. Success is measuring what you are doing against what you can do. All right, for example, take this piano. This is a baby grand piano. Now, the piano was designed for what? To play music or to, to, to give off positive musical vibes. So someone has to play that piano for the piano to experience fulfillment, okay? So if we take this piano, put it on a gold pedestal, put diamonds all around it, put it in a glass case, that piano, though it is in the presence of a lot of things of worth, is a failure. Why? Because success is based on what you are doing against what you can do. So as long as the piano is not being played, it is not being successful. You were created in the same fashion like the piano. There is something that God wants for you to do. And until you start doing it, you won't experience success. All right, let me give you another example. Bring the piano back. So let's say the piano is being played. So it is experiencing some level of success, but it was designed to be played seven days a week, but it is only being played two days a week. So that means there is five days of potential that is left untapped. And that is a lot of us. A lot of us are op operating beneath our potential. So you're experiencing some level of success, but that's not all that you, you can do. You've settled in just being the supervisor when God created you to be the owner. You've settled in just owning one when God designed for you to own two. You've settled in renting when God created and designed you to be the owner. 
So that means you're operating beneath your potential. So you're experiencing some level of success, but not all the level of success because it's based on what you can do. Okay, now, there are things that are buried in our soul. And there are experiences, there are events, there are fears, emotions that are hindering us from operating in freedom and experiencing fulfillment. And if we do not deal with these layers in our lives, See, when you come to church, when you come, this is more than just a shouting experience. We run around, sweat it out. Maybe you burn some calories, maybe not, right? You may be entertained, maybe not. See, like even for some of us, we live in a day and age where some people are saying, all right, God, I don't know if this, th this church thing worked. Because it's been five, it's been 10 years that I've been trying this, and it's not working. Just nod your head. I know, I know. Just, just, just nod. Because everyone in life wants results. And if you say, no, nah, I'm just here because you love the Lord, you're lying. <laughs> you li you're lying. Because people attending Bedside Baptist right now, you know, just watch the church on the internet, Bedside Baptist, right? They love the Lord. People want results. The reason people switch churches is because they want results. The reason people switch jobs, switch companies, switch spouses, whatever, they want <laughs> They want results. <laughs> I don't know where that one came from. <laughs> oh, Lord. So if we don't deal with it, we won't experience fulfillment. Look at somebody say, fight for your freedom. Fight for your freedom. I love God. Here's why I love God. I love God because, one, God's not like people. Thank the Lord. And two, he does not see the way people see. So for us... He sees according to how something is supposed to be, not what it is. So when, when, when people see a coward, God sees a conqueror. When people see a wimp, God sees a warrior. When, see, when people see someone that is a victim, God sees someone that is victorious. When people see someone that is a failure, God sees a winner. So God sees the way it's supposed to be. And then one of the mistakes we make when we interact with God is that we're telling God what it is and he's telling us what it's supposed to be. And so God says, hey, I need you to do this, start this business, I need you to move out by faith, I need you to move in this area, and you're telling God what you don't have. You're telling God what you're missing. You're telling God what you need when he's like, I wouldn't ask you for something that I didn't already know was already in you. Oh, you, you guys going to make me work this morning. So Jacob's name means trickster. He did not have a positive reputation and was always someone in transition. He had a lot of issues to sort through. And just like Jacob, we have a lot of issues. Say amen. amen. Yeah, yeah, we crazy. Like we have a lot of issues. We got these tendencies. We got these ways about us because of our experiences and because of transition that we go through in life. Now, some of those issues are directly as a result of the decisions that we've made or initiatives that we did not take. Other issues that we deal with that we face are as a result of things that were outside our, of our control. But nonetheless, here they are. We have these issues, we have to deal with them. We got all these questions in our mind. We got all these things going on in our soul that we're trying to figure out. Where does God fit in all of this? You know, we got all this thing going on. And so we have to work it out. And see, because of transition, we rarely get the time to deal with our issues. Life happens so fast that we don't really get to, to finalize some issues that we go through in life. Think about it. Some of you guys just graduated high school, and now you're getting ready to turn 40, <laughs> 45. Where did the time go? Come on, y'all know, you know, you came across an old picture like, man, time flies. Like, some of you, your kids are now driving your car. You just was handed them from, by the doctor, and here they are. Like, who's this grown man in the house? 
Who's this grown woman talking back to me? Life happens. In two weeks, we'll be in April. Can you believe it? Like, is it me or where did February go? It was like January, March. Like February, the only thing that happened in February was Black Panther. That's the only thing I remember. Like I remember that weekend and then it was March. So what am I saying? Time is flying. Like you don't have time. Like time is flying. We're gonna blink one more time. You may be back here at our one year anniversary. We're six months. We're six months old already. Time is flying. You don't have time to play with. And so Jacob is now told by God to go back home. And he is faced with, he is faced with news that unsettles him. Your brother is coming here with 400 men. See, 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 circumstances and crisis have this way of disrupting us. It has this way of interrupting us. Crisis and danger has a way of getting our attention and unsettling us. And Jacob takes a moment and he takes the matter into his own hands because that's what we do. When things are not going our way, we don't go to God. We go to the phones. We go to Facebook. We inbox. We message. We call everyone. And God is the type of God. I love him. He's patient with us. Why? He lets you expand. He lets you use all of your resources. He lets you call everyone on the list. He lets you call everyone that owes you. And they don't pick up. So he lets you leave the voicemail and everything like that. And he lets you run out of resources because that's where it really starts. And he was left alone at Jabok. Now, let's get into the Bible a bit. Jabok means this. Jabok means a place of passing over. It also stands for struggle. It means to empty out or to pour out. So the Bible often references different bodies of water whenever it's trying to make a correlation to transition. Say transition. Whenever the Bible is talking about certain transition, God allows us. And he allows certain events in the Bible to take place that are parallel with bodies of water. So there are certain transitions that we all will go through in life. I want to talk about it. Like, I want to give you your entire Christian life in like two minutes. Because if you figure this out, you'll know where you are along the journey. Like, this walk with God don't have to be complicated. This walk with God, God is very intentional. He tells you everything up front so you know what to expect. But, all right, so let's get deep for a second. There's three bodies of water that the Bible references that is associated with certain transitions that you and I will go through if we take the initiative. The first body of water, write this down, is the Red Sea. Say the Red Sea. Sea. See, whenever we reference the Red Sea, that's the first one. I want to give you the other one real quick, and I'll explain them. The second one is the Jordan River. Say the Jordan River. And the third one is... The fort of Jabbok or Jabbok, what we read here. So the Red Sea, first and foremost, is whenever you see the Red Sea, it's referencing salvation. It's referencing a coming out. When we read about the Red Sea, God's people are brought out of bondage, right? Come on. Come on now. Stay with me. God's people are brought out of bondage. That's the Red Sea. So that transition is referencing God taking you out of something. God pulling you out of something. So everybody either went through that already or you will. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, amen. The Red Sea is available, right? Then there's the second one, which is the Jordan River. See, so God brought them out. And there's a lot of people who come out of the world or out of the world system, but they never go into the promised land. They're stuck in this wilderness of fear, doubt, uncertainty. So so you're out of bondage, but you never into the promised land. See, the Jordan represents substance. Say substance. See, that's when you 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 get the inheritance. You get what God has promised you. And that's where a lot of people are. We're in church. We're having a good time. But here's the problem. See, we can have the possession, but never into into the rest of the Lord. So we are in the promise, but we don't have the presence. And that's where Jabbok is important. 
J. Bach is surrender. See, this one right here, this right here will let you know whether somebody really walks with God for real or they're just comfortable playing church. See, because when we come to church, we celebrate the substance, but we don't glorify the surrender. We celebrate what we have. Oh, God is a good God. Oh, yeah, I prayed for something and he gave it to me. Oh, yeah, we love the Jordan River, but we don't talk about the time we got to surrender. When it's like, you know what, I'm in my feelings and God, I don't want to do this, but because I love you, I'm going to surrender. I'm going to turn it over. Like this is where we give God what he asked for. God, I know you gave me substance, but you, you want me to walk away from the substance? You want me to bless my, 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 my brother who don't have with the substance? Oh, God, I, I see I have two cars here. God, you've been good, but he don't have anything. You know what? I'm going to surrender one of the cars to him because that's j Bach. And you got to be serious to step into that place with God. Those are the transitions. I'm telling you, God calls you out of the world. God gives you what he promised you. And then you know what? He see if you give what he promised you back to him. Surrender. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. And so the Bible talks about these transitions. And so now J. Bach does a few things. J. Bach See, God will allow us to get to a place of Jabok, right? Well, Jabok is this. God will allow situations and circumstances to bring us to the end of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Some of you guys are there now where there's no family, no friends, no pastor, no praise and worship, nothing. It's just you and God. That's a Jabok place. Why? God gets you to Jabok. Why? Because at Jabok, it's asking one question when you get to j -Bock. Is this about God or is this about you? You got to answer that question. What is your motivation for what you do? That's why we go deep. What is your motive? Why do you want that? Why do you want your business to prosper? Why do you want a bigger house? I'm not saying anything's wrong with any of those, but why do you want it? Is it about God or is it about you? I remember when I got, and, and, and many of us will go through different j box in our life because God will keep revisiting us at different times to make sure that we're growing and we're maturing in him. So it's not just a one-time experience. He keeps doing it until there is nothing left to be poured out. There is nothing left to be surrendered. Like he has all of you, right? I remember a Jaybach experience where I wanted to go to med school, right? I wanted to be an obstetrician. I wanted to deliver babies. Did all the research and everything like that. Unbeknownst to me, it wasn't physical babies. It was spiritual babies. But I remember God saying to me, and I did the research. I was like, okay, 11 years residency, come out, first 350 but may have to pay back the debt first, but okay. All right, 350, private practice, 500,000. I did the numbers, and I remember God clearly say this to me. You can go and do it, and I try to justify it. God, come on, can you imagine the tithe I'll be bringing to the church on $500,000 on just one business? Come on, y'all know y'all do that. God, this is why you gotta bless it, because I'm gonna give. And God said this to me. You can go and do it, but you'll be miserable. You'll be miserable. And I remember, and I told my mom, hyped her up, and I remember going to my mom and saying, Mom, because in, 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 the, in the Haitian household, you either are a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or you go into politics, right? So when you tell a parent, a Haitian parent, that I'm about to break your dream <laughs> that you have, that's, you know, like, come on, parents, when kids come to you and go, you don't want to do that? It's, come on, because we try to vicariously live through our kids. Like, come on, go do that. And we brag about it. And so I remember telling my mom, I think God's calling me into ministry. It was a J. Bach moment. It was a surrender moment where I gave away all of the research that I did, and now I'm forced to start from scratch. Like, I don't know what ministry I have because I grew up, ministry was not desirable. Right? Like, nah, not from my experience. But I surrendered 
I don't know what to expect, but you know what, God? I realized it was a J. Bach moment. And I want to talk to you guys because the Holy Spirit's impressing upon me. God's tugging on your heart about something. Surrender it. Surrender your dreams. Surrender your goals. Why? Because what he has for you is better. What he has for you is better. And so we have this moment. We have this j moment. See, everyone has layers that they can choose to look into or you can choose to lock it away. You got these layers going on in your heart, in your soul. You can choose to look into them and investigate why you do certain things, why you pull a certain way, why you feel a certain way. You can look into it and truly try to get better or you can go, well, this is the way I am, so whatever. Then you're going to have to deal with it and you lock it away. But you're not going to grow that, that way. See, it's painful to open the cut or reopen the cut that has already closed. But just because you're not bleeding don't mean that you're healed. See, see, when we have bruises, when we have internal wounds, there is no blood on the outside. But if we don't cut you open, you'll die. And God has to do surgery on our hearts because we're not bleeding on the outside. But a lot of us are bleeding on the inside. A lot of us are bleeding on the inside. Look at somebody say, fight for your freedom. See, unresolved issues in our heart and our soul can undermine us in purpose. See, God created you to walk in freedom and experience fulfillment in purpose. So what happens is frustration comes from not fully operating in purpose. That's where frustration comes. Kenny, let me borrow you real quick. Dwayne, let me borrow you real quick. Borrow you guys real quick. And I need a person to represent fear. Khadijah, come here. You'll be fear. Okay. So I want to make this plain, clear. All right. Stand over there. All right. Khadijah, come here. Fear. Face that. Come here. Come here. Come here. Okay. Stand right there. Actually, yeah, right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Okay. All right. Kenny, you'll be freedom and fulfillment. Stand. Actually. Step aside right there and stop. All right, bring me the chair. Fulfillment, you got frustration. I want to show you guys what it is that we go through in life. All right, most people in here, if not, but majority of the people, or you know somebody that's frustrated. Say amen. amen. And frustration happens when you're annoyed about not able to achieve something. You're trying and trying. It's not working. You're like, OK, we're going to do this budget, and we're going to set the money aside, and then we're going to build the savings. And something always comes up. It's always somebody's birthday. It's like, how many kids do they have? <laughs> right? It's like, another baby shower? <laughs> Sorry, parents. <laughs> right? And so eventually, we're frustrated because we have these goals that we want to get to, but we can't get to them. That's frustrating. And then there's the other frustration that comes from when you're out of purpose. Like, you're just not doing what you were created to do. So frustration automatically sets in. It's like a bird that is in a cage. It was designed to fly. You're frustrated. So frustration is like a chair. And that chair is not designed to be comfortable for you, because God make sure that you are not comfortable in frustration. It's like that chair with only three legs that are balanced, that extra fourth one, you just can't get the right balance, right? So most of us are in the seat of frustration. And we want to experience freedom, we want to experience fulfillment, but there are certain things that we're afraid that's standing in our way. So we want to start the business, but we're afraid, where's the money going to come from? So we're, we, we, we stay content in frustration. We stay in frustration when God designed for you to operate from a platform of freedom where you make your own decision without any hindrance. And fulfillment where you live out according and you develop your full abilities. That's God's plans for everyone in here where you walk without any hindrance or resistance and you fully develop to your full potential. So there's this platform of freedom 
that God designed for everyone to operate in, but we're stuck somewhere here between frustration and fear. See, there's certain things that we're afraid of, and so we won't experience freedom. To experience freedom, we have to face our fears. To experience freedom, we got to be willing to leave our frustration. We got to let frustration, like we get so sick and tired of being sick and tired where it's like, you know what, I don't care if I lose the house, if I go broke, I can't stay in this job another day. Or what God does, I love God, because some of us get so comfortable in our frustration that we try to make frustration feel fulfilling. Well, you know, this job is good. You know, it is as a 401. We talk ourselves into staying somewhere longer than we should. And you know what God does? He interrupts the economy. Hey, we love you. We love you. But we got to let you go. You know, like God forces you out. But you're still left to deal with your fears. So now you're out here. So we could either face our fears and get to freedom and fulfillment. But what do we do? We look for another situation that we know we're going to be frustrated with in another six months to a year. Right. And so there's only one thing left to do if you're stuck between frustration and fear. Frustration. And fear. You have only one option, and that is to fight. That is to fight. You got to get up off of your things that are frustrating you and fight your fears and fight your fears. Why? Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God already set you up to win, but you got to show up to the fight. It's already fixed. The guy's going to take a dive. You just got to swing. You don't even have to hit him. He's going to fake it. He's going to drop to the floor. They're going to count the 10. They're going to count the 10 counts. It's kind of like McGregor. It's already fixed. Y'all yeah, didn't think that was a real boxing match, right? A hundred million dollars, it's already fixed. Did you, that wasn't boxing? He was holding them and it's not, so it's already, all you have to do is show up. The problem is most people don't show up. Your fears cause you to stay frustrated. What if it don't work? What are they gonna say? I can't start that. I'm too old and we're frustrated. And you know what's gonna happen? If you don't fight, you are gonna die frustrated. You're going to die frustrated because this world is moving. You're just going to sit here and just hope things change? No. You better be ready to fight. And so when you fight, you can leave frustration behind. Watch this. And here's how this happens. So now when you leave frustration behind and you leave fear behind and you're walking in freedom, fear of being frustrated again keeps me fulfilling and pursuing freedom. Like, you know what? I'm so afraid of being broke again. I'm going to keep hustling. I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to keep working. I'm so afraid of being, you know what? Fear don't go away. Fear now is a motivator. I'm so afraid of going back there. Never again. Right? Come on, give them a hand for that example. You may be seated. Until you are willing to get up from your seat of frustration and face and deal with your fears, you will never stand on the platform of freedom and fulfillment. Jacob renamed the place Jabok. He named the place from Jabok, which means a place of total surrender, to Peniel, which means a place where it means the face of God. And the revelation in that is this. When we fully surrender, we will see the face of God. The areas that you are or have not yet, saw, the areas that you don't see the face of God or the hand of God, the provision of God, the instruction of God, the insight of God, the favor of God. There are certain areas we don't see God in our lives. Those are the areas that you haven't surrendered yet. So whatever area you want to see God move in, surrender it. God, I, want, I need you. God, I need you in my marriage. Surrender it. 
turn over the control. God, I need you in my finances. Surrender it. Make him the Lord over it. God, I need you in my business. Surrender it. Have you ever, I know this is a weird question. Have you ever took the moment and asked God, what does he want to do? We got all these plans. Okay, we're going to do this and I'm going to do that. Stop for a second. God, what do you want to do with this business? What's your plan for it? So I make sure that I do. God, what do you, what's your plan for this marriage? God, what's your plan? Like, God, what's your plan for these kids? I don't know what to do with them. I remember praying. We were in transition, and it was time for Josh to go to school. And so we had enough left to make sure our bills were paid. And we paid, I wrote a check for the first week of school. We sent him to school, right? First week of school, and I promise you, Emmeline and I, we stood at the front door, right? We sent him to Star Child, right? We lay hands and say, God, this is your child. This is your child. You know, we always say, like, this is your kid. Now, now when they acting up, it's your child, right? <laughs> so, so we say, God, this is your child. If you want him to get an education, you're going to have to either, A, provide. We were number 12 on the waiting list. We were number 12 on the waiting list for his school, for Josh's school. By Wednesday, I don't know what happened. The school called us, the public school called us and was like, we have a slot available for him. You can bring him. I was like, why didn't you tell me that on Monday before I wrote the check? But okay, God. Okay, God. It's a seed. It's a seed. It's a seed. Y'all know I'm not the only one. Like, couldn't you tell me before I wrote the check? But the point of that was saying, if you don't provide, it's not happening. God, I've said this before, and you have too. God, if you don't feed me, I don't eat. You got to get to a place where you depend on him. You depend on him. So the areas that you want God to control, give you perspective on, are the areas you're going to have to surrender. You're going to have to turn it over. See, God only reveals this intimate side of himself with people who are hungry and desperate for him, who desires to be close to him and willing to surrender to him. Write this down. Intimacy with God requires total surrender. If you want to have intimacy with God, you got to totally surrender. You got to. And that's what that's the job. Like pastors, leaders, ministers. That's our hardest job. Trying to get people who were built to have control to turn over control is hard. But there's freedom in it. You will not experience presence, his presence at Peniel until you surrender your pride at Jabbok. I'll say it one more time. You will not experience his presence until you surrender your pride over to him. And if you are willing to fight, you can turn every environment of struggle into a sanctuary for God's presence. You can turn every struggling relationship into a model of hope and restoration. You can turn every struggling dream, vision, and business into a glorious reality. You can turn every setback into a success if you are willing to turn over control. So how do you fight? All right, let's do this real quick. How do you fight? One, you fight in prayer. You fight in prayer. Mountains will move. Giants do fall. You got to have that. You fight in prayer. Number two, you fight in planning. What's your plan? See, when you're frustrated, pray. When you're frustrated, plan your way out of the hole. See, there are certain exercises that you have to do with yourself so you don't go crazy. Okay, so, okay, all right, so I'm making 10000 a month. All right, how, how am I going to spend it? I know you don't make it, but plan that. See, that's where you start inching out into faith. Because what happens is, if God bless you, you don't have a plan. So you got to make a plan in the event that it happens quicker than you thought, so you're ready. You're like, oh, one day I'm going to have employees. No. What would you do with five employees? What would you pay them? When would you be your off days, right? What would you do with 20? What would you do when you get your dream? If you're not a parent yet, how would you say, what kind of parent do you want to be? If you're not married yet, what kind of spouse do you want to be? You plan that. 
Why? That's how you fight. That's how you let the devil know this is not going to last always. So I'm going to plan my way because I'm coming out of this. And then what you also do is you are persistent. You are persistent in that. I want to show you something real quick. And we'll finish out. I want to show you something real quick. In Luke, turn to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 8, verse 1, it says this. One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. He wasn't saved, y'all. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see what she gets. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Stop for a second and write this note down. Here's a principle that we're getting out of this real quick. It says this in verse five. Here's the principle. Consistency and persistent will eventually break the resistance. You guys know people that it's like, you know what? Here, because I don't want you to ask me again. It's like, oh, here they come again. Just persistent, you know, like eventually there's a reason why them Jehovah Witness keep coming back to your neighborhood. <laughs> Somebody gave in. All right, man, come on. Come on in here. Come on. Just come on. Just really? That's in the Bible? Yeah. yeah. Persistent. Mm hmm. I think I got him lean. Like, you know you're my wife, right? <laughs> now, fellas, I said that after we were dating. Don't be going around, going around claiming people, <laughs> you know, you my wife. Hashtag Me Too movement. I'm telling you. All right. Verse 6. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Mm -mm. I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, this is a very depressing verse. We'll talk about it some other time. How many will he find on the earth who have faith? Why? Because the trust in God, you can see it's diminishing. People don't trust God anymore. They don't come to church. They're selfish. They don't love God anymore. Faith is being diminished. Why? Because of disappointment. How can I trust a God that I don't see any results from? And so we keep getting the, the disappointed and eventually we have what's called a broken spirit. That's what happens. When disappointment keeps mounting up, we have a broken spirit and we take matters into our own hand. But if you follow the word of God, you'll have results and those results will reinforce your faith but you got to turn over control first okay all right so Jacob was so scared and frustrated he fought and got his freedom now as I'm closing as a result God changed his name from Jacob to Israel which means if you're willing to fight your character will change the trajectory of your life will change but I wanted to show you something in verse 31 it says in verse 31 in Genesis 32, just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him. Here's the revelation in this. The revelation is this. One, God is light. God is light, which means those who press and seek after God have a different glow on them. They shine and stand out from the others. You could tell people who just spend time with God. The Bible says when a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies be at peace with him. They go, you know, no, no, not him, him. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? When you walk with God, they think twice about foreclosing on you. They think twice about taking it away. Why? Because they know you got a relationship with God. And we're going to get back to those days where we go to God for the issue. We bring it to God. And he starts, when a man's ways please, even his enemies are at peace. And number two, here's the revelation. God does not reveal to hurt us. 
He reveals to show us what may be hindering us from being free and experiencing fulfillment. As I close, I want to encourage you to do four things. One, use frustration as a fuel. How do we move forward? Do this. Use frustration as a fuel. Be so sick and tired of where you are that it keeps you up at night, but not just wandering at night, but you're planning. You're strategizing to say, you know, what? I'm willing to give up sleep for this dream. If you're not willing to give up that and sacrifice for that, you will never be free. Use that frustration as fuel. I'm so upset about this. I should have been further in life. Don't get mad. Don't 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 regret. Use it as fuel. Number two, face your fears. Face your fears. If it's not going to kill you, you can face it. You know, now, if it's going to kill you, then that's a different situation. (laughs) But if it's not going to kill you, face your fears. Number three, pursue fulfillment in purpose. Go after the things that fulfill you. Do the things in life that fulfill you. And number four, fight for your freedom. You got to maintain it. Once you get it, you got to maintain it. So don't get comfortable once you get free, once you get the things you want fight for it. Keep and maintain the discipline that got you it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word as we've dive deep beneath the surface. I pray, God, that the words that were spoken, though I may be out of time, God, I'm not out of notes, but I trust that enough has been thrown out that it will hit the good ground of your people. God, give them the boldness to fight this week, this month, this year, until they experience and walk in freedom and fulfillment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, put your hands together for the word. One more time, look at somebody and say, fight for your freedom.